what we have in store for you is uh, kind of an overview, hitting some of the highlights of the work that has uh, taken place over the past year, but also where we're headed, some of the projects that are still in process to give you a preview of what's coming up. And then we'll also provide uh, time through the chat toward the end of uh, answering whatever questions you have, whether it's about our land projects, our water projects, our management issues, or public access. So we'll leave time for that as well. So if you bear with me for just a second, I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, well, hopefully you're seeing a pretty lake shore, which is Bell Station. <clears throat> uh, this was the largest, um, the, the most uh, ambitious project ever undertaken by the Land Trust, where uh, we work, worked on this project for more than a decade. And I'll talk a little bit, a uh, little more about it in a bit. But uh, successful protection of 3,400 feet of shoreline and a lot more to come on that. But I want to just kind of keep some geographic order here. So I'm going to go from east to west. And uh, one of the highlights of the past year was the dedication of the first new county park in Onondaga County in 20 years. And that is our board member, the former Congressman Jim Walsh at the dedication beautiful site at the very south end of Otisco Lake, kind of swampy shoreline where uh, the, it, the park is actually dedicated as a conservation area. So it's uh, more of a wildlife refuge, uh, 2000 feet of uh, wetland shoreline planted uh, with partners, including the Onondaga Earth Corps, over 700 trees and shrubs, and they're all doing great. If you're ever up going up that way, this is on the east side road and uh, at the very south end of the lake, you can just pull off really nice access down to the lakeshore, good birding spot. A lot of work over in Skinny Atlas in the past year. Uh, our work there continues in partnership with the state through its water quality uh, program. Uh, in this case, you're looking over the 234 acre Casa farm on the west side of the lake. And we purchased a conservation easement to prevent subdivision, but also to enhance stream buffers. So through the easement, uh, we're keeping that farm intact, but we're also ensuring uh, wider vegetated buffers for water quality protection. Now over on the east side, uh, we've been very active as well. Uh, for those who haven't been there, the Hinchcliffe and High Vista Preserves have great hiking, uh, lake views, extensive diverse uh, natural areas. And we added a key puzzle piece, uh, a six acre parcel reuniting it with the original High Vista preserve. Uh, this is one actually before I worked at the land trust for the last 20 years and before I was in Washington. So a good 30 plus years ago when I worked for the Nature Conservancy, we were trying to secure this parcel for the land trust and it was set up and conveyed to the New York uh, Natural Foods Association, which became a defunct nonprofit. So we kind of had to rescue this parcel. And the highlight of the negotiations over the last 15 years was that at one point, the last uh, standing board member of that group wanted to barter the land for a laptop. Uh, unfortunately, our attorneys would not let us do that. But we successfully competed at tax auction, key parcel, build up a lot right next to the trail if you're ever there, so a little more forest habitat secured. Now, if you look at this map, you see uh, orange color land on the map. That is uh, farmland and also woods. We conserved last year about 500 acres on the east side of Route 41. And this year we'll be working on another 600 acres. So this is a, a real success story here. We've protected going on about 2000 acres. And this is a view of that corridor where we've conserved, uh, we have about 450 acres of preserved land that we own. Uh, we have about a thousand acres of easements, and now we're working on 600 more this year. <clears throat> Jumping over to Owasco Lake, uh, we've been working for a number of years at the Owasco Flats, uh, an extensive wetland area at the south end of the lake. And this is an area that's been altered considerably over the years for farming. In some cases, farming continues, but in sites such as this, 
it's really too wet. So the farming has been abandoned, but the ditch systems that altered the wetlands, as well as the invasive reed canary grass that's there that dominates it, persist. So here on land that we acquired for the State Department of Environmental Conservation as part of creating a new wildlife management area, we're actually partnering with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This was, um, what do you think, Kelly? Late It was October, right? This is a contractor. What you see here is excavating shallow water habitat. And the other part of this is plugging some of these ditches. Uh, so come spring, you'll see a lot more water on the site. And this will create a uh, better habitat for waterfowl, resident bald eagles, and also create more diversity uh, because of the, the history. It's very kind of solid reed canary grass and trying to diversify that. Um, next up at Owasco is a wonderful conservation easement. We expect to finalize shortly on the west side of the lake. Uh, family farm, uh, the Post family uh, is donating easement on 160 acres. And as part of that, they're committed again to water quality where we will be working with partners to expand some of the uh, vegetative buffers along the streams. And here is an example, uh, looking at one of the crop fields uh, where uh, our two of our staff, um, Chris Ray and Max Heitner, are standing right about the line where the foreground will be retired. Uh, there's a stream you can't see, and we're going to be adding natural buffer and replanting with native trees and shrubs here uh, probably next fall. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of this going on wherever we're working with landowners, particularly farmers who may have, say, 50 feet of buffer along a stream, trying to expand that and revegetate that. And the challenge of the revegetation is getting those native trees established in the face of invasive shrubs that grow much quicker and voracious deer populations. So we're very much in learning mode and I look forward to happy trees and shrubs at the age of 10, because I'm hoping about then we can spend a lot less work on them. Uh, now back at Cayuga Lake, uh, as I mentioned, Bell Station, uh, biggest purchase ever. It was a bargain at $3.3 million. But uh, we not only acquired the property right before summer, uh, we were able to invite the public on. This was open to the public pretty much right after we acquired it. Again, the land trust is an interim owner. Uh, hopefully next year, the state will be in a position to buy the shoreline portion of the property. Uh, getting it ready for the public, uh, we did make some improvements. Along the old rail grade that runs along the shore, we uh, were fortunate in acquiring a very sturdy footbridge that was constructed as part of a class for SUNY ESF students. It was transported and positioned in place here. Uh, we also did some other basic trail improvements and a lot of site monitoring. Uh, historically, this property had been abused by uh, drinking and partying and whatnot. And we are really thrilled to see the community come together and see appropriate use at the site. Uh, now, the big news is that we are now under contract to add uh, additional land here. Uh, if all goes well this spring, uh, the area you see highlighted in yellow, uh, which includes the now defunct Cedar View Golf Course, about 110 acres, which is really prime development land, particularly because we've secured 3,400 feet of nearby accessible shoreline, that will all be acquired and added to this new state wildlife area we're creating. On the map, you can also see how Bell Station is divided into two portions where, uh, based on the town of Lansing's interest and the state's interest, we're also exploring the possibility of uh, solar use on the eastern portion, and that exploration continues. Um, but everything, the green and yellow, will be uh, a state wildlife area. And this is a view of what these former golf courses look like. Beautiful site, uh, great lake views, combination of mature woodlands uh, going down to the lake in this more open area. One of the things we're going to do in, uh, with guidance from both Audubon and the uh, State DEC Wildlife Bureau that will ultimately manage this area is some selective removal of trees to enhance it for grassland bird habitat. Uh, these scattered trees uh, serve as uh, perches for birds of prey, so it, it makes it less optimal for grassland birds. And this is a species, these are a suite of species of particular conservation concern. 
Here's a kind of a view from a drone. You get a sense of uh, the continuous band of forest um, along the shoreline and some of these former uh, fairways that are now being renaturalized. And then here you can look to the south across the golf course towards Bell Station and uh, the fields over on Bell Station, the, the row fields closest to the lake will also be on the wildlife area. So we're hoping that the state, working with the state to have a significant grassland resource in this area. It's been a really big year for Lansing. Uh, not only did we acquire Bell Station, but we also acquired our Cayuga Cliffs Preserve that includes more than 4,000 feet of frontage almost on the lake. It's actually on the railroad, which is the lake frontage. But, so we essentially secured the lake shore and has a similar band of woods and fields up top. Um, this shows you though, it's a, a, the property extends probably a half mile from the lake to State Route 34B. And as we prepared to open the site to the public, we were aware of how limited our frontage was on State Route 34B, 60 feet to be exact. And it really was far less than ideal for designing an access way and also residential development is really increasing in this area and uh, we wanted to buffer the entrance as well. Fortunately, we were able to negotiate a purchase contract. We now hold on 23 acres that you see highlighted there. And uh, we will close on that later this year. It's additional uh, hay fields, but most importantly, it allows us to kind of design uh, the access we would like uh, that is both safe, spacious for the expected use and will allow us to put in a pollinator garden, uh, bioswales for the runoff from the parking lot and really design it the way we'd like to. This will also allow us a separate laneway for any tractors for mowing and whatnot. Uh, this is something we'll be uh, working on during the coming year. And uh, as soon as we uh, complete closing on this so that we can uh, open the site to the public. Now, one um, major project that where we work behind the scenes that I don't have a slide for, but is great interest to the community is Camp Barton. And I just checked on that project, not under contract yet, but I'm told that there is a meeting of the minds between the Boy Scout Council that owns this beautiful camp on the Western shore of Cayuga Lake and State Parks on a purchase agreement that isn't in place yet, but is looking good. And at the time um, that the agreement is executed, it will be simultaneously a license agreement will go to the village of Trumansburg, the town of Ulysses and the town of Covert who will be responsible for managing it as a public park. And this will be a tremendous win for the community, a great partnership. And we were delighted that the state was able to buy directly from the scouts and we didn't have to step in for interim financing. Um, Again, we helped guide the, step, the scouts from the beginning. And to define our role, I would simply say that when we first approached parks on behalf of scouts, they said, no, they wouldn't do it. And then between the influence of us and a lot of others, they then said, yes, and it's all looking good. Um, I wanna recognize in the, the land of Zoom faces, I saw Carolyn Eberhard. And I want to recognize Karen for, and her husband Anatole for a wonderful gift. Our newest preserve opened uh, this fall. The Eberhard Preserve is in Ithaca's Emerald Necklace. And it's beautiful woodlands uh, at the south end of the Coddington Wilseyville Valley. Uh, and now it also hosts uh, a wonderful access to the Finger Lakes Trail. Uh, the Finger Lakes Trail previously crossed that valley further north in an area where the route wasn't secure and subject to a fairly long closure period. And we were able through this uh, new preserve, as well as two parcels we acquired to add to adjacent Danby State Forest to create a secure corridor all the way down to the middle of the valley, uh, the abandoned rail grade there. Uh, so this is now open. And uh, this was a great year for partnering with the Trails Conference because we also uh, partnered at our Summerland Farm Preserve a little further east. And we, that partnership involved uh, creating safe access. The, our preserve has been open to the public for several years now, but it's right at the crown of a road. And one of those places is a little dicey to pull over on the shoulder. And yet we realized that our land, we have a beautiful hilltop meadow 
that happens to have a school bus turnaround that you can't park in, but we really thought it was not the best spot, while across the road is a state forest, which did have the best spot, but they had no money. So we partnered with the trail conference uh, and we helped the state get this uh, parking lot, which is important because it, it's, it's a beautiful uh, spot with 30 mile views and it was getting popular and also a little dangerous at that spot. Uh, the, the other public access project in the county uh, is right next to Robert Treeman State Park. Uh, we last year bought uh, a key parcel there and added it to our Tap and Mitra Preserve. And this year created the, a, a fairly uh, large parking lot because of high levels of use. And in the spring, we will dedicate that site once a, a wayfinding kiosk is finalized. Uh, also within the Emerald Necklace, uh, a, a foray into historic preservation for us. Uh, the late Margaret Ball left us for both her land and this beautiful 200 year old house that needed a considerable amount of work and needed to be restored. And uh, we partnered with Historic Ithaca and a private buyer. So it is now in private ownership, but subject to uh, some facade easement that, that, that require maintenance of the historic features and also some limitations on uh, use of the yard that uh, between the yard and the public road so people can see this beautiful house and restoration is now underway. What we're focused on though now is the land, which as you can see that area in green uh, is contiguous to Treeman State Park and we're exploring um, long-term conservation options and plans with state parks as well as the Finger Lakes Trail Conference and the Cayuga Trails Club and one of the expected expected uh, additions will be uh, the addition of a hiking trail that will be a loop off the Finger Lakes Trail uh, extending through the property, uh, exiting state parks kind of to the west, and then crossing back into the east. So this is something we'll be working on with with parks, uh, the Trails Club, and the Trail Conference during the coming year. Uh, not very far from there, uh, we also are uh, working to protect a beautiful stretch of the Cayuga Inlet in the vicinity of Shelter Valley Road and Newfield Depot Road in Newfield. Uh, this is a beautiful trout stream. It, along with um, what you see here, there's some pretty scruffy former farmland that is uh, covered with a lot of honeysuckle brush. And it's a very important floodplain though. This area has had some real flooding problems with property damage. Came on the market, uh, we were delighted because we uh, already own 50 nature preserves and we look at really uh, carefully evaluating our capacity to manage all this. And in this case, we reached out to a partner group, uh, the Wetlands Trust, which focuses on stewarding wetland properties. And they were not in a position to help us with the purchase of this land, but they were able to commit to the stewardship. So we went ahead and as I was on the property, the realtor informed me that the 43 acre property I was standing on, only 41 were available because Dollar General was already under contract for the two acre corner lot. So we kind of sighed and then, um, you know, we went ahead, bummed out because also it was a prominent corner. So it was visually going to kind of dominate that part of the property. So lo and behold, it appeared that Dollar General did this before the new FEMA floodplain maps came out. And suddenly there were new floodplain maps and some issues arose and we, uh, their contract fell through. We put more money into the project. So now we're getting off 43 acres. So if you drive down State Route 3496 south of Ithaca, you see an unbroken view and that's what will continue. Uh, once we close probably in February, uh, we'll work with the Wetlands Trust, uh, both on management, but restoring and control of invasives on it. Uh, looking ahead, uh, we have some really key additions. This is a view of one of my favorite preserves, Lindsay Parsons, a little further down that same road in West Danby. And uh, a small puzzle piece of eight and a half acres, but really important, includes uh, half of a wetland that's half in the preserve, half out. It is a property that'll provide access to the next road to the north, Station Road, and also it'll allow us to clean up an illegal uh, tire dump that's been on our border for as long as the preserve existed. So again, um, uh, a small but important acquisition. 
Similarly, down in the Shemung River, where several years ago we acquired 200 acres of bottomland uh, just off the river you know, to create a new state wildlife management area. This week, or maybe next week, we're acquiring a giant two acre parcel. Um, it's really not giant, but it's so important because the 200 acres is about 200 feet from the river, but doesn't touch the river. So these, these two acres will allow for public access to the river of what we hope is a growing uh, wildlife management area on a beautiful river. If you've never been down there, uh, great paddling, and great birding. Uh, over on Seneca Lake, we were thrilled uh, to receive a gift of undeveloped shoreline, which in the center of this photo where you don't see docks, that's 1,100 feet of uh, mature forested shoreline uh, donated by the estate of Robert Chris, uh, about 30 acres that we hope to add to eventually. Uh, but in the meantime, just a wonderful uh, stretch of undeveloped shore that uh, was very developable and now will just be left alone. Uh, I'm right now on Seneca Lake too. Some of you may have heard that another Boy Scout camp is for sale. Camp Babcock Hovey is a um, located in the town of Ovid, about the midpoint of the lake. It's 288 acres with about a half mile of shoreline. A lot of concern because it's located between a state wildlife management area, Willard Wildlife Management Area and a state parks golf course that has undeveloped shoreline. The three properties together have a mile and a half of contiguous shoreline. So we're working with the scouts and the state, hoping to do something like Camp Barton, um, but this time it could be either DEC or parks, very complicated, very expensive real estate. I think it's currently listed for $9 million. But again, um, one of the last opportunities to secure a stretch of shoreline like that. Hopeful, hope to have good news on that next year. Uh, on over to Cuca, uh, we are right now, uh, per, we, we hold a conservation easement on the tip of Bluff Point, but we're right now pursuing our first acquisition on the Bluff. So hope to report more on that uh, later, but also this summer as a way of engaging that community and landowners there. We actually shared a summer intern, a graduate of Hobart and William Smith, who was based at the Finger Lakes Museum in nearby Branchport. So it was a great partnership uh, where our intern worked both for the museum and for the land trust doing landowner engagement and really seeing the benefits of having a seasonal presence there. Over in the Canandaigua watershed, you can see Bristol Mountain Ski Area in the distance. Uh, this is Stid Hill, where we acquired about 70 acres that is includes frontage on a tributary to Canandaigua Lake, will be added to a state wildlife management area. And then over at Bear Hill, uh, we um, added land to the Bear Hill State Unique Area and are right now pursuing what would I think would be our ninth acquisition there. So some of these sites have very fragmented ownership and it's just uh, your support allows us to year after year be persistent and uh, you know, aggregate these areas. Uh, just today, I was over where, at, where you see in this photo, this is the south end of Honey Oil Lake, which has wonderful extensive wetlands. This is part of now a 2000 acre state wildlife management area that is now contiguous with Harriet Hollister Spencer State Park that's on the west. It is contiguous uh, to our Wesley Hill Preserve, the Coming Nature Center. There's a growing network of about 5,000 acres of uh, conserved land here. Wonderful resource, wonderful wildlife habitat. Last year, we added three small parcels that were important because in this undeveloped context, they were buildable. And these were kind of uh, just gaps in the ownership to just, that were important, particularly for future management. Today, I was out there because we're under contract for another kind of puzzle piece uh, modest in size, three acres and about a football field of frontage, but really important wetland buffer that we will uh, jump in, acquire the land, and then when funds are available, sell that to the state and make that part of the public conservation area. A little further west in the watershed of Hemlock Lake, which if you've never been there to paddle, Hemlock and Canada ice are really worth the trip. Uh, totally undeveloped shorelines, drinking water supply for Rochester, 
And this is a view of one of the tributaries where the Good family donated a conservation easement on a beautiful gorge. And it is contiguous to uh, a part of Harriet Hollister Spencer Park and part of a, a really a growing green belt that has uh, an incredible array of wildlife and also hosts native brook trout. Now, I focus a lot on the, the newest kind of real estate projects, but I want to take a moment to recognize the, the growing stewardship program we have, which is everything from the day-to-day -day of uh, dealing with in our forested landscape, how many things fall out of the forest onto your trail when you have miles of trail. So everything from keeping our places safe, whether it's the uh, trails, the parking area, what have you, um, to really trying to manage habit, habitat for our native species and prioritizing those that are in greatest conservation need. Uh, earlier in my show, I showed you a picture of the wonderful rolling meadows of Lindsay Parsons that are largely due to our neighbor and volunteer, John Smith, and his efforts to restore that habitat. Well, once again, with a partnership with the US Fish and Wildlife Service through a loan of their tractor, uh, just the last few weeks, um, staff has been tackling a long neglected meadow in the very south end of Lindsay Parsons. And you can see it was really on the verge of no longer being a meadow. This was, um, looks like Chris only, I can't tell, one of our one of our stewardship team, but here's here's the result. Now we're gonna get back to a uh, much really restore, not a brushland, but a, a meadow because this little guy, the bobolink, and then we also have Eastern meadowlark nesting there too. And these are species of really great conservation concern, particularly because of the intensity of modern agriculture on one hand, and then the succession of this habitat on the other. So um, this more and more, uh, we're doing a lot more in habitat management, as well as having a lot more of trails to take care of. And of course, we couldn't do that uh, without all of our volunteers. Uh, this is our new Cayuga Cliffs Preserve, cleaning up an old farm dump, and uh, you know, just people pitching in in lots of different ways. Every year, we really appreciate more and more support. Um, so that was just a brief overview of what's going on. And at this point, wanted to open it up because I just scratched the surface on a lot of different things and want to open up for many questions you may have. If you want to put them right in the chat, that might be the easiest way, just because there's so many people on the call. Um, I do have a question already, um, Andy, if you could talk a little bit about the extent to which the Finger Lakes Land Trust projects will be able to access or leverage funding from the New York State Bond Act and what the time oh, frame for that, that we're, funding. We're very excited about the Bond Act and uh, the, the state is developing the framework for spending the Bond Act, which is right now very general. So we're eager, there will be a land conservation component and we expect that it will reinforce some of the existing funding sources we've had each year for the past decade, or actually several decades, the state has an environmental protection fund that's an annual appropriation that includes funds we've tapped for farmland protection, water quality projects, and for these, these cooperative acquisitions for the state. There's also a brand new program in partnership with the Land Trust Alliance that's just in its first year, but is really needs a lot more money but could be a game changer for us because it is a conservation easement program for forests. And without this program, we, have a, we can compete for funds, for farms, for conservation easements, or for special water quality projects. But if you think of all the woodlands that we'd like to secure, there really isn't a program for it. So now we have that program, but it's, it's really needs a lot more funding. That's where we're hoping the Bond Act can help. And then also on some of the management front, uh, we could really use a lot more resources for habitat restoration as well. So we're, we're optimistic. Do you want to talk at all, Andy, about the 30 by the 30 for 30 goals and how that might affect the land trust? Yeah. Um, for those who may not be familiar, um, 30 for 30 is idea and legislation both to this 
create a set a goal of conserving 30% of the United States by 2030, which has been kind of endorsed nationally. But then there's a companion state, there's actually state legislation passed by the assembly and the Senate, but unsigned by the governor. So um, it is a simply saying that the, the state department of environmental conservation should come up with a plan as lead agency for how the state can conserve 30% of its land mass. I think we're about at 19%, which much of which is the Adirondack Park. Um, but we have actually written a letter recently encouraging the governor to sign this because she doesn't have to. Um, and then it would just, it, it wouldn't happen. And it's a goal. So it's a, it's a framework uh, and we, we think it's important. And it also folds in the state, if you're not familiar, has an open space plan that you can Google and find on the DEC's website. And that's that's renewed every so many years. And this is a year when it comes up, there'll be some public hearings and so on and an opportunity. But we think now is the time, um, particularly in our region where our lakes are under stress. Uh, we already have a uh, landscape that's very fragmented in terms of ownership. And we really need to plan for connectivity and climate resilience uh, now. It's, it's not gonna get easier. Um, I have a, a question about if you can just talk a little bit about how the land trust allocates funds between new projects and stewardship of existing projects. Um, well, a couple things, and, and I want to recognize everyone who helped us uh, achieve our goal for our capital campaign. We've been working, and Kelly has had a little bit to do with this. Um, <laughs> Kelly has been the, the, the one who's made this all happen along with all of our co-chairs and our volunteers, but we've been able to raise uh, $20 million for conservation, which is uh, orders of magnitude before what we've done before. And that includes funding to cover our, our operations for, for several years, which some of it's already spent, uh, money for land like our Cayuga Cliffs Preserve, money for our opportunity fund, our revolving fund for things like Bell Station, but then our endowment, which even with the market decline lately, we've been able to put away about eight or nine million and uh, increasing that. So there's, there's endowment funding uh, that is set aside with each new commitment we take. At the same time, apart from the endowment, there's also in our operating budget a stewardship component. But we also know we need, we need to grow grow the funds available for, for custodial care, as I call it, but then I'm really hoping that we can increase the resources for more robust management, dealing particularly with invasives and um, regenerating forests in the face of deer overpopulation. Uh, so both of those I think are big challenges and to try to demonstrate models that private landowners can do on all of that acreage that we don't, don't have. Great. Um, I have another question. There's so the company Micron is coming to central New York, which will bring with it some jobs, but there's also concerns that we we'll use a lot of water. Um, do you have any thoughts on its potential impact? Uh, I've read about it and, and Micron, I think one of the reasons they located where they did is access to Lake Ontario water. So it is not an issue for the Finger Lakes, but I think it is uh, an issue of concern, but I don't know honestly enough about it uh, to know, uh, you know, the specifics or or how significant a concern it is. Great. Does anybody else have other questions? That's all of the questions I'm seeing in the chat right now. You must have answered everybody's questions with your presentation. <laughs> There's plenty more. One thing I should mention is that we I only give you a preview of projects that are pretty, I don't want to jinx them, but they're pretty solid are going to happen. At any given time, we're also pursuing uh, some lands that we don't get, uh, but maybe we'll get it in the future. Or, or there are ones that um, just can be uncertain for for a long time. And, and that's part of a lot of what the land trust does is try to pursue as many of these in these priority areas as we can, 
and recognize sometimes it takes generational change. So it might take 20 years of effort. Um, I have one more question from somebody who's really appreciated volunteering for the Finger Lakes Land Trust. And they're just wondering if they're what else they can do in addition to volunteering if they're, you know, not in a position, they don't have a large parcel of land that they can, you know, help help conserve with us. But is there thoughts on other things people can do to? Well, I think um, aside from the land trust where uh, Volunteers are essential, but our capability, our capacity for how many people we engage sometime outside of stewardship in the field has, has some limits. Um, I would also look that our, our watershed group partners, every lake has a watershed group, and they're so important and, and, and the needs are really so great for, for example, stream monitoring or, or outreach as well, that if you look at lakes like Cayuga or Seneca that are miles and miles and miles of shoreline. Uh, that's such a need as well. And just encouraging, uh, welcome everyone to the land trust, but also recognize our partners. Uh, they also have significant opportunities too. Great. That might be it. Great. Before everyone goes, the one thing I will let you know that we haven't done that we want to do is partner as part of our water quality initiative with uh, demonstrating ways to mitigate uh, stormwater runoff that currently comes out of tile drains and agricultural fields. It goes into road ditches that typically erode very deeply before shooting to the lake. And that's just been a kind of a vexing issue where we're reaching out to soil and water conservation districts and county planning agencies and highway departments. But that's that's kind of an unmet need that is not just the, the land trust, but all the watershed groups is a concern of all of us. But that's something that uh, uh, thus far has eluded us, but we continue to pursue. Um, kind of along the lines about road ditches, um, there is a question that just came in about what incentives are there uh, for small farms in the watershed to build stream buffers? Um, there, are, there are grant programs, but I think, frankly, they, the, they may not, the, the value may not be enough. Thus far, we, we found they're not attractive enough to get a lot of interest because a couple of the concerns too, if you think of creating a buffer that's legally enforceable, it's kind of a scary thing that you're drawing a line in a field that today is a hay field, but tomorrow would be hay and then brush to think of, oh, if somebody who works for me crosses that line, they could get me into legal exposure. And this is state funded. So can the state come after me? And who, do, who, who who's gonna deal with all the invasive shrubs and all that? So there's, there's a lot of, tr first there's a lot of trust building that has to go on and then um, it, it, at the same time, there are funds available, but there no one's going to get rich on it. So um, we're doing some buffer work, but it's it's a lot more conversations. But I I also understand where the farmers are coming from. Uh, that it, it's 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 a leap in the unknown. That's why on this post property on Owasco Lake, it's so important because one of the buffers is right next to a county road that will be easy to see. And I think part of this is demonstrating this can be done without a lot of headaches and the farm is doing fine and all that. So uh, that's where not only will we uh, make these sites available and to visit on occasion, we will also try to get good photography and widely, you know, publicize them so that people can get more familiar with them. And you have a question um, that came in from somebody who's just wondering, what is our region? Like, what are the boundaries from we that is the one slide I forgot to put in. The, uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the, it's, it's ironic that we deal so much in the natural world. The easiest way to describe this is the Pennsylvania state line, uh, roughly Interstate 81, roughly the throughway, and then 390 south of Rochester. So it's, it's not quite exactly that, but that's pretty much it. Um, within that, though, because it's such a big area, we do have identified focus areas such as the Emerald Necklace around Ithaca, the Canandaigua Highlands at the south end of Canandaigua, 
the um, Skinny Atlas Highlands, uh, the Shemung River Corridor. So we uh, do have areas that we've uh, aligned with other conservation plans of government and other groups that we try to be much more proactive. Great. Well, I think that is it. All right. Well, thank you all so much for uh, joining us tonight. And thanks so much for making it all possible. Yeah, absolutely. And anytime, don't hesitate to contact any of us if you have any questions uh, moving forward or have suggestions. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful night.